Well, good evening and welcome to our service this evening. Few in number, but Scripture reminds us that where two or three are gathered together in your name, then we're in the midst of them, and we thank you for that. And a special welcome to those who may be watching and listening online. It's good to have you with us, and we trust that as we want a blessing for us here, wherever you are, whatever your situation, you will know God's blessing this evening as we share this time together. On Friday evening, I was looking through my notes for the uh, service this evening, and I read a, a, an account in the scriptures about um, the wars that go on in the world. And I thought, the Bible's got a lot to say about that. The Old Testament, if you look into it, was full of people who were always warring and fighting and killing and being killed. So what I've done, I've brought together the three versions of what the scriptures say about wars and rumours of wars and try to apply it to our lives and our world today. The scripture says, there will be wars and rumours of wars. These things take place, but it's not the end. Nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes and pestilences, and who can argue that that isn't a picture of the world today? Many people believe that we're living in the end, what they call the end times, when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to earth. It's impossible to know when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, because that God, the Lord Jesus himself said, it's not up to you as to when God comes. It's not even up to me, the Son. It's in my Father's time. And I just pray that people might not take the words out of context. One of the problems I found with um, anticipating the end times is that you can read the scriptures and depending on your point of view, you can come to one conclusion, but for another point of view, you can come to another conclusion. Sometimes the scriptures aren't very clear with it. I'll give you two instances. There's a time coming, according to some people, called the rapture, and their belief is that the Lord Jesus will instantaneously take all the Christians, all his servants around the world, up in the air to be with him. Uh, you can find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. But if we look into the Old Testament, Hezekiah chapter 14, it says this, The Lord Jesus will return and stand on the Mount of Olives. When, where, how the Lord returns. Can I suggest that how and when isn't important? The important message that comes from the scriptures is that whenever the Lord Jesus comes, he comes suddenly. The Lord Jesus said about the ten virgins and who had their oil for their lamps. And they came and the bridegroom took them in. And the other ten hadn't got oil, so they had to go and buy some. And they came to go into the wedding feast. And the, the, uh, the, the bridegroom said, I'm sorry, I don't even know you. So my question is really... Not so much how, when, and why, but are we ready? Are we ready for the second coming of the Lord Jesus in whatever way he comes? And I trust that uh, perhaps after this evening you might share with me one or two thoughts about that. I'm in contact with a church in um, the Philippines, and they're doing an amazing work. When they go to take people for baptism, they have to hire a coach. There's so many of them. And one of the words they use almost every time I read their newsletters is the word Maranatha. And they very much live in that because Maranatha means our Lord comes or our Lord is coming. And I trust that as we think about these things tonight, we too might be aware that 
now is the accepted time and now is the day of, day of salvation. Scripture says so. And may we as those who trust and love the Lord Jesus make sure that we are ready whenever he comes. Another little story that was told is a wise man who um, knows there's going to be a burglar coming. He doesn't wait for the burglar to come in. He just waits and to stop him from coming. And I think that it's so important, this whole question of not when and how the Lord Jesus is coming back, whether it's to the Mount of Olives or whether it's in the air or whatever else it is. The important thing for you and me this evening, whether you're watching online or in here, the important thing to remember is that the Lord Jesus Christ will come back and that's a promise he made, and the Lord Jesus never made a promise they didn't keep. May we be waiting and watching for him. Before we read these two verses, the background is that uh, uh, Elijah had challenged the prophets of Baal to a competition to decide who was the greater God. Was it Baal or was it the God of uh, uh, Elijah. Of course, they called on the God, uh, their, their gods, and cut themselves and danced around, which was their practice. But of course, the altar they built with the, the offering on it just stayed as it was. And uh, Elijah begins taunting them, well, perhaps your God's asleep, or perhaps he's gone away. And they did even more dancing and cutting themselves, but obviously nothing happened. And so Elijah said, right, I'm going to build an altar. And he took 12 stones, one for each of the children of Israel. He put the sacrifice on it. And he then asked them to pour water over it and then to dig a ditch round about and fill that with water as well. And when that was all done and everything was soaking wet, Elijah looked up to God and said, please, Lord, effectively show these people who the real God is. And fire came down from heaven. It didn't only just take up the sacrifice, it took up the stones and all the water as well. And that was one of the things that made me think about my subject. Prayer, when a person prays, can bring miracles. And that was one of the only few or only many of miracles in the Old Testament. I didn't realize until I started looking just how many miracles there are in the Old Testament. A lot of them, of course, to do with the children of Israel and God. And so the second reading, we're going to jump a bit, is right over to Genesis chapter two, the first seven verses. And I've chosen this one because I'm going to try later on in the evening to suggest uh, where a certain situation comes from. We'll have different ideas about it, but I've got some idea of what I think might be the answer to the question. So Genesis chapter 2, we're going to read down from verse 1. Then the heavens and the earth were completed, all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested and from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that, that which he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The Lord made the earth and the heavens. No shrub on the field had yet appeared on the earth. No plant of the field yet sprang up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the land. The streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the earth and the ground. The Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, and he became a living person. And I'll just like to consider that a little bit later on. I said that if I had a title for my talk this evening, it would be, if people pray, miracles can happen. Let me define, first of all, what does the dictionary say 
about a miracle? What is it? And I read here, an extraordinary event that goes against nature cannot be explained by science and that Christians believe is caused by God. As far as the Bible miracle concerns, I suggest that these were lessons demonstrating just how power, how much power the Lord Jesus had. This showed authority over nature, demons, disease and death, and many, many other illnesses. Jesus was supreme and he did all of these things. As I started again thinking about the message, um, and this came to my mind last week when our preacher here mentioned the same verse. It was James chapter 5, verse 16. You don't uh, need to re uh, read it. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, when I was reading this, I thought, does God hear the prayer of unrighteous people? And that's the question I'd like to share with you at the beginning of my uh, talk tonight. Last week, I took you back to when I was 17 years old and gave you my testimony. Tonight, I'm going to take you back even further to 1939, when I was five years old. I can't remember much about that time. But certain things um, do come to mind. And one of the things I thought about and I found out was that during World War II, the King, King George VI of England, on seven different occasions, prayed that the whole nation would come together to ask God for help because the nation was in a terrible situation. They hadn't yet decided whether Hitler was going to attack or what he was going to do, and there's a lot of worrying and concern. So King George VI, uh, and he's the only person who could do this, called the whole nation to, pray, to prayer. The first prayer, the first prayer that was offered was because they needed a miracle on the beaches of Dunkirk. You probably know the story. And um, on three of these miracles, the Lord Jesus, uh, God used the weather as a means of uh, bringing about the miracle. As far as rescuing the British army uh, from France was concerned, on the day that they were there waiting to be captured, 338,000 or so, the Germans had cut them off. They had nothing in front of them but the English Channel. And the nation, by their millions, came and prayed for safety. They filled every church they could find. Even small church churches would have been overflowing. And um, the big cathedrals, millions of people came for one purpose, to pray that God would give a miracle over the beaches of Dunkirk. And the miracle happened. Over the French coast at the time, there was a terrible storm and a lot of the German aircraft were grounded because they couldn't fly. And also, over the beaches of Dunkirk, there was a lot of cloud and smoke because of the war and the burning buildings and uh, tanks and stuff. And the problem was that the German Luftwaffe bombers couldn't find out where they were couldn't find out where they were queuing up. And they were queuing up three, four deep, up to their waists in water, just patiently waiting to be lifted off. But the English Channel at the time, irrespective of the storm, was absolutely calm. And Churchill, who was a prime minister, called for help, and he asked that everybody who had a boat that could get as far as Dunkirk would take it out and help rescue these soldiers. And they were able to do so, even though the storm was raging over Dunkirk. And somewhere around 338,000 men and French, French and Englishmen were brought home safely to England. And that was the first answer to prayer of the first time the prayer was made. The second one, 
um, was when the Battle of Britain came, prayer was made. I'm not going through all seven, it would take too long. Prayer was made that the uh, German Air Force wouldn't break through and the miracle happened over a period of about five or six weeks. The Royal Air Force was able to stop the German bombers and it prevented them from doing even more damage. And that was again the result of a prayer, a miracle. The last prayer, the last day of prayer, came in 1944. The prayer this time was for the safe landing of the troops on the Normandy beaches. And again, millions turned out to pray for that. And again, the Lord used nature to bring about a miracle that saved so many lives. If I have time at the end, I'll just share the actual story with you. But one phone call from one person changed the lives or deaths of thousands of troops, all waiting 380,000 or so, all the battleships were all ready to go and um, launch into the D-Day landings. But then this one phone call changed all of that. But I'll tell you that story, I think, a little later, provided I have time. I believe, and I lived through this, so I know this, but I believe that God personally performed another miracle in 1939 without people praying. It was just one of those things that God did. And it concerns what I've got in a box. I brought this along because I think it's a good idea to remind some of us just how old we are. But this is an original gas mask from 1939, and it's identical to the one that I would have had when I was five years old. So this is 1939 children's gas mask. If you look closely, you'd see that there's a lot of tape around it in front and at the back and inside. The reason for that is that they didn't realize at the time that this canister, which was a filter media, was in fact filled with blue asbestos. And those of you who know the problems with blue asbestos will appreciate that if children had to wear these for any length of time, then they would be breathing in blue asbestos. But it didn't happen. The Germans didn't drop the, what they used to call the mustard gas in the trenches in the First World War. It was in fact chlorine gas, which was low laying. And because it was low laying, it was very effective in the uh, trenches in the war, killed a lot of people, blinded a lot of soldiers. But that was chlorine gas. And they call it uh, mustard gas because chlorine will burn, burn your skin. So I think that uh, the um, World War I people, there were hundreds of people later on in life who had breathing problems and they couldn't, couldn't find out what it was. And then they found out that all the gas masks issued to the troops in the First World War in the trenches had the same filter media, blue asbestos. And so I believe personally that um, People who experienced uh, lung problems and uh, all sorts of other illnesses. In fact, it wasn't the mustard gas. It was breathing in the small particles of blue asbestos. And uh, I remember my father, who comes from a coal mining factory, he had a lot of problems with uh, breathing and always seemed to be coughing. And he wasn't in the war, he was in a reserved occupation, but he came from a coal mining country. And I believe what happened, he had the same thing happen to him as chlorine did, uh, as um, uh, asbestos did. And they call it the Black Death, because the mining particles of coal, when the miners were down there uh, mining the coal, 
got into the miner's throat, and when it touched the inside of their, uh, their lungs, it changed into a chemical, and that possibly could, could be up to 50 years later. So a lot of people in the First World War in the trenches, with people like uh, coal, uh, coal dust uh, poisoning as well, a lot of those people died just because the wrong things were used. And I remember my father, he died when he was 60, but I never found out what he died from. I wonder perhaps if, as an ex-coal miner, he might have, in fact, died from this black death forbidden in the coal mines. I hope you don't mind me bringing that, but I think it's a good thing to remember, looking back and remembering perhaps how blessed we were and how it was a blessing that God didn't perform the miracle after prayer. He performed it before, because he knew the problems that were going to be there if the children had these gas masks. And so that's why I was... Um, uh, I bought it along this evening, because some of you may never have seen one before. I don't know. Um, if you were born after 1945, you probably haven't. But I thought it might be of interest. And there's also a message. The gas mask works by... When you breathe in, it takes the air from your lungs, fills your lungs, and then you breathe out. And this part of the uh, filter is, in fact, the area where the blue asbestos was. The Bible teaches that we've got a protection. We've got a, a God who knows and cares. And I think the picture of that is that um, irrespective of what the mask did or didn't do, God enabled people to live as a result of it. Can I just quote uh, a, a little verse coming from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5? We have a protection between the evil in the world, represented by the gas, and we have a protection from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture in 1 Timothy says this, For there is one God and mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And that's what we've got, stopping all the evil, coming into our lives all the time. The speaker last week said that society, and especially against the church, is chipping, chipping away at our foundation for our faith which is the Lord Jesus Christ. But the, the Bible says this again, Ephesians chapter 6, talks about putting on the whole armour of God. I'm not going to go through the individual items, but the things that are mentioned there for our lives, the armour of God that will defeat Satan, are these truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the Holy Spirit. And all of those things are covered by that particular verses in that chapter. We have a protector, we have a God between us and Satan. And it's brought about, I know I don't have to repeat this. It's brought about by the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by God into the world, as it says in John 3.17, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that's the sort of saviour we have today. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever wondered why People call out to God where they're in danger, especially if it might end in death. There was a lot of fear in 1939 to 1945, and people called out to God and he heard them. But why is it 
people call out to God when their lives are in danger. Well, I'll tell you what I believe, and I must admit this is my own personal opinion. I read the first chapter, second chapter of Genesis because it says God breathed into Adam and he became a living being. And I personally believe that there is in each every individual, each one of us, a tiny part of God. They call it various things, but um, it's generally known as a soul. Now you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't operate on it, the, the uh, medical science can't understand it. It's just impossible to try and appreciate something that is given by God that we can't see, hear, feel or touch. But it's there. And I think that when people are in need, in danger, that little bit of God that was put into them comes to the sort, comes to the front, and enables them to know what they want to do. It's, it's only a, my opinion, but have you heard of the term clinically dead? That little piece of life gives life to the whole body. But when a person dies and becomes clinically dead, that's the time that that little something called the soul, or whatever you like to call it, goes from the body and returns back to God who gave it in the first place. And that's just one possible explanation why people call out to God and why so many people call out because they're afraid. People pray because they're afraid. There was a lot of fear, un fear of the unknown in 1940, 1945 and 39, because nobody knew what was happening. From the statistical point of view, England didn't have a chance of stopping Hitler in his plans to invade England. But through prayer, and through God answering prayer, those seven times, seven miracles came to being. I wonder, I'll tell you about that little story, shall I? I'll have to read it because I've got it written down here. It's possibly something you've never heard before. One of the things of being old is you've got a lot of memories of what's gone on in the past. It was reported that an Irish postmistress and her husband-to-be joined the whole of World War II. They lived in Northern Ireland, right on the uh, edge of the western coast of Ireland, and every day for the whole of the war they repeated the weather forecast that they had seen. They were in a good position to do that because they were nothing between them except the Atlantic Ocean and America. And so the information they give about the weather in around uh, and around the uh, coast at that time would give the uh, Allies a good idea of, for example, would it be good, would it be rough so submarines couldn't come, would it be calm so the convoys could get through, so this news every day, either this woman or this man made, was absolutely important. And for the whole of the world, they made these, sorry, the whole of the time, they made these phone calls. They never knew what they were for. They were secret because theoretically anyway, the Republic of Ireland was a neutral country. And so they carried on sending these messages. But around about the 3rd of June, 1944, this lady, whose, whose name uh, was Maureen Sweeney and his wife, she happened to be in, be in contact with London and she gave the latest weather forecast from this Irish location right at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. But she was most surprised because she got a letter back, a phone call back. Never happened before because everything was done in secret. 
And so she gave the usual weather forecast on about the 3rd of June, 1944. As usual, she didn't know anything about it or who was going to get it. But for the first time in those five years, she got a worried phone call from the government in London because her forecast said that there was a deep depression and a period of bad weather coming into the English Channel on round about the 5th of June. Because she was so faithful and her husband, as she came to be his wife, because they were so faithful in their uh, broadcasting and their warnings and their weather pattern, etc. Somebody in the meteorological, met, I can never get that word out, meteorological office um, in London was very concerned because the 5th of the June, when this bad weather was going to come, was the same day as the planned invasion would have begun. Because of the faithfulness of these two people, and in this case just one woman and one phone call, the meteorological office in London decided to try and get General Eisenhower to change the date of the D-Day landings. And so it was changed by 24 hours. On the 6th of June, the invasion of Europe took place. And that was all the result of one person being faithful and not knowing what she was doing, not that she knew what she was doing, but she didn't know where it was going, or how it was going to be used. And in fact, that one phone call delayed the Normandy invasion by 24 hours. And 24 hours later, the channel was calm again. And that again is the last recorded miracle that uh, King George the, the, the Sith called for the people to pray about. The thought that went through my mind was there was one man who changed the course of the world in the same way as that one phone call changed the uh, history of Europe and ultimately was instrumental in uh, the Allies winning the war. I was reminded that there was one person not a phone call, but his name is Jesus Christ. He didn't just save one person, he didn't just save thousands, because if the landing craft had taken over the channel in the rough weather, they were probably sunk, because they were flat bottom, they would have turned over and thousands of lives would have been lost. And so that one phone call saved thousands of troops from being drowned or killed in other ways. And that reminded me that there was one God, and I mentioned this before, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God sent his son into the world, as I mentioned earlier, not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. The gospel message, basically, is that God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to take our sin away, but to bear our sin in his own body. And I've got some verses here. And I've just taken these down. It's a little summary of what it says in the scriptures. I've already mentioned 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God, a medi one mediator between God and the man, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself for our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. This is the Lord Jesus we're talking about. And going right back to Genesis, therefore, just as one man sin entered in the world, this is Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and death through sin and death spread to all men because all have sinned, Scripture said, all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, it says in verse 17, For if by the transgression of one death reigned 
the one much more those who receive the abundance of grace and righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Adam sinned and the Lord Jesus, when he died, he took the sin of the world upon him. So what, what, what can we gain from what I've said? Firstly, I think that nothing is impossible with God if we believe when we pray about it. One of the essential things about answered prayer is that we've got to believe that God answers prayer in the first place. And one of the things uh, about when I was five years old was the fact that in those days, England was a Christian country. God was honored. They believed that uh, in the Lord Jesus, the Church of England was its height of power, and those millions turned out because they knew that God answered prayer. And they were rewarded, weren't they? For you and me, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour, then we too have that salvation, that mediator, and we have it because he was a mediator between God and us, the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was 17 years old, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Saviour, and for me, a miracle happened. I asked the Lord Jesus to cleanse me from my sin, to confess my sin, and asked him to come and clean my life out and change me so that I might be through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who took my sin, become a believer in him and try to live my life for him. And that was when I was 17 years old. And if there's people out there watching and listening to me tonight, can I remind you of another scripture? The scripture says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And I have here a prayer, if I can find it, that I probably uh, said uh, when I was a Christian, when I became a Christian, it's from the scriptures. And it was said, if we confess with our lives the Lord, with our mouths the Lord Jesus, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And that's what I did. And can I challenge all of you here, and all of those who are listening and watching online, please consider your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave his life, took your sin, and took it all away by God's providence and he took your sin as he took my sin away. And the scripture reminds us that there is a time when it will be too late to make that decision. Scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is a day of salvation. I trust that all of those watching and listening might indeed experience that joy, that something that miracle that happened to me changed my life completely. And um, that miracle happened because I prayed that prayer. If you feel you need the Lord Jesus to come and clean your heart and mind and accept the fact that God sent him to clean your heart and mind it by his death on the cross, but he didn't just stay dead. He rose again on the third day and is now back in heaven. I trust that little bit of something of God that I believe gives you life and which when it goes away as you return to God, I believe that little bit of something may be saying to you, what's your relationship with the Lord Jesus? Do I really need him? And that sort of question, can I say unequivocally that yes, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, it says so in the scriptures, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. No, 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 um, not yet, perhaps another time. There's no strings attached, like there's so, uh, so many things attached to strings today. I was just reading recently 
that the latest thing that they've found about our supermarkets is that they're charging the same price for the food as they've also always done, but they're only partly filling the bags, which is, of course, illegal. So we're faced with so many temptations, so many things around us, but let's always remember the gas mask. We have a filter between us and the sin of the world through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I trust that might be your experience as it was, as it was for mine all those many years ago. May God bless you and help you to make that decision in favour of him. Amen. The bottom part of the gas mask is the canister in which the media that filters out the gas is supposed to stop. The top part was the mask that went over the child's head. I'm not going to do it. Um, and the, we had to carry these 24 hours a day wherever we went. I do think it's a miracle that we never had to use them. Incidentally, this is the original box and the original piece of string from 1939.